wanted to talk to you guys today about charges in your experiment. Most people don't even realize that they're there. You can do a high voltage display where you discharge ions from one place to another and what you're not realizing is the charge on both things. One will be positive, one will be negative, and it goes where there's more charges at. So in that type of thing, you're trying to create one that has a lot more mass in it and a smaller mass in the other one. As it discharges towards the larger mass, it does it because of the amount of charge on it. Let's take this first experiment here. We have an all thread going to the center. We also have a quarter inch coil of copper. I'm going to use a 24 volt battery with a ZVS connected to an AC flyback and put a voltage multiplier on it as my power source. I'm going to manipulate this from sparking completely like this into something totally different later based on the amount of charge. As you can see, I was only able to create the sparks. I wasn't able to create an ion field. So let's change the all thread with something else. When I put the two saw blades in the center, I am now getting the ion field that I was looking for. I was able to create the display properly. So what does this experiment have to do with the charge other than you're creating plasma in between the two? Watch this next experiment. I'm going to move the coil by putting the saw blade on the outside, creating enough charge in it to move the coil. So we got to see the charge pull the coil a little bit, but mostly what we saw was the high voltage. So can we thin out the amount of voltage and get to more charge? Let's take a look at this next experiment. We're going to charge a rod and move a can. It's going to work by pulling the can towards the rod. Then we're going to switch the experiment. I'm going to use high voltage and I'm going to get eddy current to push the can away. But I'm going to do it based on the amount of charge that I put into the experiment. As you can see, we have a simple cloth and a PVC pipe. We rub the pipe. We create the charge. Pretty simple, right? Everybody's probably done this by now. But have you done this? I'm going to take high voltage here. The same circuit I used earlier. And I'm just going to push the can. I'm doing it based on the charge. It's eddy current in it, but the underlying factor is the amount of charge that I'm putting into the can. Now that I've added an additional length to my voltage multiplier and I sanded the can, I can now create an even better charge in the can. As you can see, when I don't spark it out, it actually makes more 
charge on that can than it did before. Just to make sure that we're not using ion wind, I went ahead and brought everything closer together. So I can show the ion wind effect and rule it out. We're still using the same can, the same voltage source. As you see when I bring it closer, we're no longer moving the can. You can see the plasma coming out of it. Again, it's not moving the can. If ion wind was what was going on, the can should have moved by now. It's not. We can see high voltage. We can then see our plasma again. Again, the can is not being manipulated at all. Why? Because the principle behind it is charge and not ion wind. With the ion wind now ruled out, let's take a look at this experiment here. We're going to take a high voltage field positive on the top, negative on the bottom, and we're going to take this piece of packing foam and we're going to get it to lift up. But it won't do it right away. It's going to stay at the bottom and build a charge. It's building the charge in it to be negative. Then, when it's completely full of negative charge, it'll then lift towards the top. As you can see, we have just turned on the device. It stays on the bottom, charged, and goes up to the top. It comes back down. It sits on the bottom when the power is off because it's still filled with charge. When the charge is no longer in it, it'll fall off. It took a few seconds for the packing foam to become saturated with the charge needed. So let's move on. Let's go to paper with a much lower saturation rate and let's see what happens. When we turn the power on we can see that the paper itself gets saturated much quicker. It now goes up to the top. When it touches the top it sparks out. It drains the amount of charge in it to the top plate. Then it goes down again gains more charge from the bottom plate and proceeds back up to the top plate. And it continues to do the same thing in a dance. So let's take a look at the power source for these last two experiments. As you can see, it's a lot less powerful. It's no longer the voltage multiplier on an AC flyback, but instead it's a DC flyback and we're able to adjust the actual amount of voltage going in. When you do that, when you're adjusting the voltage here, you're reducing the amount of amps going in and you're bringing the voltage higher. Let's take a look at this circuit more in depth. I said that it reduces the amount of amps. So let's see it wire to wire in a spark gap and let's actually see it reducing. Huh. Turn it on. You see it goes real thin. To turn it up, it goes real thick. You can see the white in it. And we'll turn it down, get it real thin. Turn it back up. See all the white in it? All the amps are coming into it now. And real thin there. So before we get back to the amount of charge in something, most people ask this question, if we can change the amount of amps going in, can we also change the frequency going in? The circuit on the left is an older circuit that I use to change the frequency. The circuit on the right is a newer circuit I use to change the frequency. It has to do with duty cycle and frequency. I add a little voltage divider in there instead of the MOSFET and you see in this one in order to get that done a little easier. Let's go ahead and take a look at the experiment.
You can't hear it now. This is at 745 hertz. You're getting what you normally get. Okay, close to this. Now that we know in order to create a charge, we need to remove the amps. Let's move on to the paper lifter experiment. This experiment deals with almost no amps. We're in the milliamps and we're using high voltage to get the charge. As you can see, the lifter lifts up. It wants to go in between two fields. It's creating a heavy charge. We don't see any spark over and we also do not see any ion wind. This experiment works on charge and charge alone. Now, in order to create this, we're going to have to take two flybacks in series. We're going to connect them together and then we're going to get the voltage for this experiment. So let's verify our experiment. Let's turn this thing upside down. Let's check and make sure the charge is still there. As we can see here, we still have force in one direction. It's actually quite a bit of force for a little piece of paper being charged. Let's change the configuration again. This time we're going to put a bigger top plate on that's curved a little more. Let's see if it still works and still attracts the charge to the bigger plate. As we can see, it still works. So let's now rule out ion wind. Let's change it one more time. Ion wind requires an anode and cathode. You would have to put something in here that was metal on the top and bottom. By changing to this configuration, and we take all of the aluminum foil on the bottom, and you absolutely have none that's available to make the connection of ion wind, we can then rule it out. If it continues to have force, there cannot be any ion wind. It must be the charge creating that force. As we can see, we still have charge in one direction. This means ion wind cannot be doing this. We have charge, and we have charge that creates force. We can now safely say, the more amps that we remove from the voltage, we can now create a heavier charge in one direction. So I guess the bigger question is, why would you do this experiment? Well, it comes down to everybody looking at anti-gravity. If a scale shows that there's force in one direction, is it anti-gravity? If it is, then can we create more force than the weight of the craft? And if we do, will it lift off? The secondary question would be, if it doesn't lift off, what will we have to do to make it lift? Can I take something like an ion wind that we know cannot lift the weight of the craft by any stretch of any imagination? And I, can I put that small force with this force right here that I'm creating to get something to lift? It's a simple question. It's something that needs to be answered in anti-gravity research. It has to be done. Too long have we looked at scales and see reduction in weight and we call it some kind of anti-gravity. Let's answer the question once and for all. By isolating the charge itself from any other factor, whether it be high voltage, ion wind, static electricity, piezoelectricity, any other part, any other factors that those things bring in, by isolating the charge, we can now answer the question. Is anti-gravity a reduction in weight? Thanks, guys. Thank you for watching. If you like what you saw here today, please like, share, subscribe, comment, do all those fun things, and have yourself a great day. Thank you.